Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, we're joined by Corey Feist, co-founder and president of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation in Charlottesville, Virginia, who's going to discuss the recent passage of the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act and what it means to physicians. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Corey, as soon as I saw the news about this, um, because we've had the honor of talking to you and your wife, Jennifer, a couple of times over the past year and a half or so, I just, it, my heart just uh, swelled. And I have to say, I uh, just want to give my personal congratulations uh, the two, to the two of you for what you've been able to uh, bring into this world. Um, by now, I think most physicians are aware of the name of Dr. Lorna Breen, your sister-in-law and an emergency medicine physician who was on the front lines of the pandemic and tragically died by suicide uh, in April of last year. You know, you've talked about the huge outpouring of support that you and your wife, Jennifer, received after Dr. Breen's death. You know, when did you realize that this problem wasn't unique to Dr. Breen um, but that healthcare providers across the country needed more support and services and that you could do something about it. Todd, thank you. That's an excellent question. And I just want to first thank you and the AMA for your incredible support through this entire process. We could not have done this without you and without your members. So thank you so much. Um, and, and, and I will say, you know, I had a whole career. I've had a whole career in medicine. And so as, a, as an administrator for the, for the medical group of all the doctors, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And so I was frankly shocked when uh, following Laura's death in April of 2020, that we heard that this was such an issue that had been hiding under, uh, kind of undercover for, for so many years. And you know after the publicity from Laura's death, um, we received for like a year letters almost every day to our home from healthcare professionals, mostly doctors who would say things like, you don't know how hard it is. You know how many times that I've had to basically step out and, um, and, and make an excuse for, uh, for you know, stepping out of the room or, or not coming to work that wasn't mental, that, uh, an excuse that wasn't mental health related, but it really was just, I couldn't take it anymore. Or I took a, if you look at my CV and there's a sabbatical or there's a fellowship that I took there. Well, actually I was hospitalized, but I couldn't tell anybody. And so that really fueled our engine towards moving in the direction of first creating the Dr. Lorna Bring Heroes Foundation, uh, dedicated to reducing burnout and improving the well being of the workforce. And then working with a bipartisan, bicameral group of federal legislators to develop um, the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, the first ever healthcare workforce federal piece of legislation. And we are just so incredibly thrilled. You know, Lorna was our inspiration for this work and clearly her death struck a chord with the healthcare community, but we're not doing this for Lorna. This is in her honor, but really we have done this for the, the rest of her healthcare uh, uh, professional colleagues and friends and and really is a way to extend her light and her deep caring for for those individuals now it's interesting i'm curious there are a lot of ways that you could go about uh, making a difference here at what point did you say we're going to pass an act of congress here so we pretty early on after the national publicity of her death we were connected with our senator from Virginia, United States Senator Tim Kaine, who reached out to Jennifer and I to express his condolences. And you know, he said, "Look, I'm I'm on the Senate Health Committee, which is the health uh, health and um, labor com uh, pension committee. I can't remember what the E stands for, but he has the He sits on the committee that actually can do something about this. And he said to me and Jennifer, he said, "If you have ideas about what we can do here, let me know." And I, I'm not sure he connected the dots that I had had a whole career in healthcare um, when he had made that offer. And so let's just say the response had a lot of bullet points and it was pretty long by email. But what it did was it served as the framework working with you know, over 70 other healthcare associations and organizations to really develop this first ever um, legislation. And by doing that, by working across parties and across organizations, we felt like the Lorna Breen Act was an excellent first step 
uh, towards addressing these issues. It's, you know, in, in these highly politicized days, it, it, it's so great to see something bipartisan uh, and really uh, targeting the folks who have borne such a brunt of this pandemic. And so that's a big achievement. Thank you. We, we agree. And, you know, this is there's so many things that shouldn't be politicized. And this is one of them. And, and from our beginning, uh, first days, we worked intentionally across party lines. There's probably not a member of Congress who doesn't have a hospital or health system or, or doctors in their own district. And so by sharing these stories with them, this became a, uh, a basically a no brainer from the perspective of any feedback we ever received from any member of Congress. In fact, I will share with you, Todd, the more that we've spoken you know, with members of Congress and just members of the public, the issues that, that impact our healthcare workforce are a surprise to many. And uh, they also feel like that's completely unnecessary and, un, and unacceptable, just as we do, that our healthcare workforce has to hide behind stigma, can't get the help that they're often prescribing for their own patients. So, um, you know, the, the intentionality of the bipartisan, you know, bicameral approach was from the inception because we recognized that this, this was going to impact all and we needed everyone on board to make it, to make it happen. And, and we've done just that. Yeah, when you see, you see those numbers, uh, sometimes I guess it doesn't connect to the people on the other end of that who are taking care of all those folks and the weight that they carry and have been over the last two years. I know that uh, one of your main goals in getting this act passed was to keep others from suffering uh, the way that Dr. Breen did. And when, uh, one way that it does this is by establishing grants. Tell us a little bit about how those grants work and what they would cover. Absolutely, and we're th so thrilled because the money's already out. So the Lorna Breen Act has, I'd say, four main provisions. The first two are grants, so we'll talk about those first. Um, their grants for uh, the first the first of the two are grants that go to the future healthcare workforce, those medical students and those nursing students um, that that really need to learn about how to prevent mental and behavioral health conditions, um, suicide, identify burnout, how to mitigate it, and and just look at increased access to evidence based treatments for for the healthcare workforce. So that's the first set of grants. The second set of grants does a very similar thing, but it's for the existing complement of healthcare uh, professionals. Um, in fact, 46 health systems received the money on January 20th, the second anniversary, second anniversary of the first COVID patient in the United States. So 46 health systems already received the money. Um, you mentioned something uh, in there. I just want to touch base a little bit about evidence base and uh, you mentioned too, also people just not aware of the significance of this particular problem. Um, how how are you addressing that? Uh, part of that is uh, an awareness and education campaign that is evidence based, uh, targeting healthcare professionals. Tell us more about that. Yeah, and so that's the third big leg of the of the legislation is this national campaign, which is established to encourage health professionals to seek support and treatment for mental health and behavioral health concerns. Um, there's also a huge education and awareness component to it. And, and I will tell you, when we first created the, this, this, the draft of this law, if you would have said to me, hey, it's important to have a national awareness campaign, I probably would have said, no, all the doctors understand this, all the hospitals understand this. But, but I have come to learn in the last two years that that couldn't be further from the truth. And what I've learned, particularly about talking about mental health with healthcare professionals, is that when something like this happens to you, something unspeakable happens, whether that be suicide or something, something that is in the stigma space of mental health, and you speak about it, what it does is it gives others permission to speak about it too and come out of those shadows. So this national awareness campaign that we are hoping the CDC launches imminently will do just that and try to help not only help the healthcare workforce identify these issues, but also find out how to, how to obtain treatment for, for uh, mental health conditions, as well as just burnout, which is not technically a mental health condition, uh, but, but certainly a part of the, part of the problem. Well, uh, just lastly, uh, obviously the AMA uh, has a huge focus uh, on physician wellness. I've uh, been working in this space for many years prior to the pandemic. Uh, we all know that the pandemic itself has, uh, like many things, worsened uh, this particular aspect of it. 
Um, are there parts of the legislation you know, that recognize and do something to address what has just been a brutal two years coming out of the situation? Yes, and in fact, I wanna come back to what you started the question with. You know, prior to the pandemic, we knew that burnout was incredibly high and mental health challenges and, and the stigma of mental health uh, were also, also high among healthcare professionals, particularly physicians. In addition to that, before the pandemic, almost a doctor a day died by suicide. 400 a year. So, uh, and, and that was probably an understatement. So when we looked at the root cause of this, and you know, remember when we created the Lorna Breen Act, this was a pretty early in the pandemic. This was right in the middle of the first wave. So it was not, it, it hadn't had the scale and the impact that it's had on the workforce. But what we did was we looked at the literature and we looked at what are the root causes of these issues? Whether the, uh, and, and one of the big ones was administrative burden on the healthcare workforce. And so one of the things that the, the Lorna Breen Act does, as we've talked about, is it has these grants. And the, the whole point of these grants is to help understand the root causes of these issues um, and, and pro, at a programmatic level. And then, it goes, and then the law goes beyond those grants to actually conduct a three-year comprehensive research study that looks at root cause and really helps us create a, a roadmap for even future legislation. So we are, we are really thrilled that the law is going to do that. But I also want to just come, at, come back to one thing uh, and connect the first part of my answer uh, to the back here. On January 21st, Met, first Medscape produced a study um, of about 13,000 physicians. And it asked those physicians, what is the rank order um, of issues creating burnout for you? And the number one issue that they identified was administrative burden. Mm -hmm. COVID is 10 out of 10 on the list. So it's important for us to recognize that, as you say, COVID magnified this issue, but these issues predated COVID and we need to go right back to addressing them in the wake of now this, uh, four, I guess, fourth wave of COVID. Wow. Uh I would not have guessed uh, that's where COVID would have sat on that particular list, but that just goes to show you what a big problem this was going into the pandemic. And I know through the research that our team does here at the AMA that they identified that, you know, 80% of uh, those issues around burnout are, are system level issues um, that can be fixed. And so I'd encourage folks to check out our Steps Forward modules where we outline those. Uh, Corey, for physicians and other healthcare organizations who are interested uh, in getting more involved in these issues, where should we send them? Yeah, so we have launched a nationwide initiative in collaboration with the AMA called All In Wellbeing First for Healthcare. Um, the website is allinforhealthcare.org. And I will tell you that that website is full of resources from the AMA and others. But I think what's more important than that is to get involved, even at a grassroots level, ask these questions um, in your organizations about what are we doing to monitor the well-being of the workforce? What are we doing in our key performance indicators that we report to our boards of directors to demonstrate the connection between the well-being of the workforce and the well-being of the patient? There are tangible things that our healthcare uh, providers, our professionals can, can engage in um, without being part of a big national movement. We'd love you to be part of the national movement, but um, there's a lot that we can do on a local level. And the last thing that I would just share with you on that is just to recognize the humanity of this moment, to recognize in yourself and in your colleagues what it means to be able to take a break, whether that be a formal mental health break or just a break from the grind. Uh, we know that staffing levels are short. We know that the, the challenges of, of healthcare persist. However, if we don't give ourselves permission to take a break and that of our colleagues, what we'll end up with is more Lorna's. And we don't want that. That is not what our goal is here. Our goal is to prevent this from happening in the future. So, you know, some of these things and some of these answers are complicated, but some of them are quite simple. And they really start with reaching out to colleagues, um, looking yourself in the mirror and making a change in the way that you're gonna approach your own self-care and that of your colleagues. Well, Corey, thank you so much to you and Jennifer for all the work you've done. Uh, the AMA released a statement congratulating Congress for uh, passing this act and recognizing the work and dedication of the two of you in making this a reality for our healthcare workforce. 
As the statement reads, the AMA is grateful to the Breen family who advocated for this legislation and the Congress that listened. It's a fitting legacy for Dr. Breen. Thanks for joining us today, Corey. Uh, please give my regards to Jennifer. Congratulations again to you. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. That's it for today's Moving Medicine video and podcast. We'll be back with another episode soon. In the meantime, don't miss another great episode here. Make sure to click subscribe on this YouTube channel or check out all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcast. Thanks for joining us. Please take care. Thank you.